Amen. If you have your Bibles, uh, I want to invite you to be turning to 1 John chapter 5. It's on page 864 in that pew Bible in front of you. And uh, while you're, you're turning there, we, uh, you'll notice in the worship guide that there's a marriage getaway February 1st through 3rd. And I know that's a long time away or seems like a long time away, uh, but we need to know by the end of this month uh, whether or not you're going to participate. So look at the information in the worship guide, and uh, if you're a married couple, please consider coming to be a part of that. Uh, we have been in the series 1, 2, 3, a study through John's epistles for uh, several weeks now, and we come to this final chapter of 1 John. And as we uh, come and approach this, I was thinking of a few things this week. Uh, one, I was thinking of the fact that I was present at each of my children's births. And honestly, I don't know how you do it, mamas. I, I really don't. I mean, it's an amazing thing to witness uh, the closest thing that I've experienced uh, to the pain of childbirth is uh, stepping on a Lego in the middle of the night. I mean, that's pretty much, and I don't, I don't know why that hurts so bad. I mean, you, you hit one of those things, it's like, you know, your kids were sharpening them or something before they went to bed. But I also uh, was reminded that after that, my, my children, each of my children have wanted to put my shoes on once they started kind of crawling around and getting to where they could stand. Uh, so you'll notice here a picture of the screen of our youngest, the most recent, uh, is our youngest case. Uh, he just wants to wear daddy's shoes um, all the time. And so if they're laying out, he'll go and he'll, he'll put his little feet in there and then he'll try to start walking and look like a big clown because, you know, he can't do it. Um, but, but this is one of the things that our, our children want to do. They want to they be like um, dad. Um, or this past week, our uh, four-year-old decided to put on a black suit, and uh, he decided to come into the, the living room and start preaching. Uh, that's a Bible there, and uh, I don't, I mean, I don't get the resemblance. I don't, I just, I don't, I don't see it at all, but uh, it must be there. Um, and so that, that just uh, is one of those reminders that our, our, our children want, want to, to be like uh, their, their father a lot of times. And if you are born again by your heavenly father, uh, you want to be like your heavenly father as well. You want to be like him. The reality is, though, in our society today, uh, there is a profound, deep uh, father wound in the lives of many people. A uh, matter of fact, one out of three or one out of four individuals even listening today is, grew up with, without uh, a father. Forty uh, percent of children will go to bed tonight in the United States, you know, without a dad. Uh, or maybe your father was present, and that was even more of a nightmare for you. Uh, maybe your father was present, but not really present, and that was a challenge and a confusing thing. So even when we start using this terminology that John's going to use today, uh, it can be confusing for some. It can be um, hard to understand that type of of an analogy. Uh, but I want us to come into the text with just this reminder. It's, it's one of the reasons that we partner with uh, Family Guidance Center down the street here. They serve about 7,000 families every single year here in our county. It's one of the reasons I sit on their board, uh, because one of, one of their objectives, one of the main things that they actually help families with is equipping and encouraging of fathers, and they have several programs that do that. Matter of fact, several of you just a few months ago on Father's Day went down to the Family Guidance Center just to encourage some of these dads in our community and just say, hey, you know, you can do it. You know, we're, we're here for you, and what a blessing that was. And so whether or not it's, it's something that you find comfort in to think about God as Father, whether or not it's confusing to you that you see God as, as Father, or maybe it's painful uh, for you, uh, my prayer is that we are reminded today that when, when God does a change internally inside of us, things begin to change externally, and that changes life eternally. And so my prayer today is that even in the midst of wherever you find yourself, is that you find healing through what John says in 1 John chapter 5, and this encouragement that he is given to us. Let's go to the text and let's read 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. The word says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. 
This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. What we remember in 1 John is that, that 1 John does not flow like a church epistle. So you have letters in the New Testament that are written to like the Corinthians or written to the Galatians or the Ephesians or the, the Philippians. These are church epistles written to the church to either encourage the church or, or challenge the church or even correct the church. You know, there, there's these letters, but John is not writing a church letter. He's writing more of a family letter. And if you've ever been a part of a family that has done this before, you can understand that sometimes there's just some things we need to talk about. All right, so you, you gather everybody up in the living room and say, hey, we need, we, we need to talk about some things. You know, and, and this is what John is, is doing. This is a familial type language letter that he's writing. And you'll even notice that in the text, as we just read a few moments ago, this, this language that comes through. Everyone who loves the what? Father. Loves his what? Child as well. This is how we know that we love the what? Children of God. By loving God and carrying out his commands. And then John goes on to highlight, and what he says is that these commands are not burdensome. Uh, you'll notice a picture on the screen of a group of women that are known as mule ladies or mule women. I know it's not a very endearing term. But what happens in this part of the world, this uh, place called Mali Malia and on the border of Morocco, is that these women uh, will gather and what they will do is they will they would carry these heavy loads on their backs because uh, Malia is a Spanish port city and anything that's hand carried from Spain into Morocco is considered luggage and therefore duty free. And so these women will make money by carrying these heavy loads across the border, sometimes the size of a washing machine, 150 to 175 pounds on their backs and they will carry them all the way across. Now, I saw an article actually recently where some of these women are now being gifted and blessed with dollies. And so they're using dollies, which is, is much... But you think of this picture of them carrying this type of weight, this type of burden on their back. They are literally breaking their bodies in order to live. And in Matthew chapter 23, verse 4, Jesus speaks in the language of such heavy loads when he war warns against the the life commanded by the rule-driven Pharisees. And here's what he says. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads, and they put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And what we see is Jesus is addressing this idea of, of all these, these rules and groups like the Pharisees that one of the things that we are reminded of is that no matter how hard the Pharisees Try, they could never breathe life into the commands. They could never breathe life into the rules. And Jesus is addressing this in Matthew chapter 23. And the call to God's commands is, is no longer a burden, John says, but it's an aspect of a new life in Christ. His commands are not burdensome. What do we mean? Well, hang on. We're going to talk about that. Verse 4, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Back in the 1930s, three gentlemen got on a bus in Detroit and they noticed uh, an African-American gentleman who was sitting in the back of the bus, and they began to ridicule him. They began to hurl insults on him. And this gentleman who was sitting in the back of the bus remained silent and did not respond. And uh, they come to the place where the, the gentleman in the back was, was about to get off, and so he stands up. 
and they realized that they did not, they, de they didn't realize how big this guy was. He was actually a pretty big dude. And so he walks, as he's getting off the bus, he hands a card to these three guys. And the card just has three words on it. Joe Lewis, boxer. <laughs> and he gets off the bus. You'll see Joe Lewis on the screen here. These three guys had no idea that they were trying to pick a fight with the guy who would become the heavyweight champion of the world from 1937 to 1949. Pretty dumb move, right? But, but here's the reality, and here's the, here's the purpose of the illustration, is, is that what is the victory that overcomes the bully of the world? It's our faith in Jesus Christ. And so we have a big brother named Jesus who can defeat the bully and give us the victory. That's why John says in verse 5 that the key to victory is believing in who? It's believing in in Jesus, the Son of God. And throughout this whole epistle, what John is going to offer to us is this triple test. If you'll notice it, almost in, in every chapter to, to what I could find, John offers us this triple test. It's going to be three questions that he, he basically is asking, maybe not verbatim, but in, in one way or the other, he's asking these three questions over and over and over again. And the first question is this, what do you believe? What do you believe? So, do you believe in Christ? And that word Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's not Jesus Christ or Jesus Lord Christ. That's not his last name. What that word Christ means is that he's the one. The Holy One. The Anointed One. Like He is the One. He is the Christ. This is who he is. Do you believe in him. And particularly what John is addressing is he's addressing this idea of this belief that has gone awry that, that Jesus is not just a good man, but what John is trying to, to address is that Jesus is the God man. That you believe in his deity and you also believe in his incarnation, that you believe in both of them at the same time, simultaneously, continually, all the time. And this is one of the things that John is addressing. And so he's asking this question over and over again through various ways. Do you believe? And what do you believe? Question number two is, where do you belong? Look at verse one. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That you're part of the family. And so here's one thing that we have done with all of our children, when we have had kids, we, we introduce them to the family. Most recently, with our now one-year-old, when he was born, here's your brother. Here's your sister. I'm your dad. This is your mom. Where do you belong? What John is reminding us of is that we belong with the family. Do families have disagreements? Anybody in this room ever had a disagreement with someone in your family? Okay, I'm glad there's two of us, me and Bill. You have disagreements with your family, amen? You do. But does, do disagreements have to create division? You know, the, the, there is this idea that we are a part of the family, and families are going to have disagreements from time to time, but we are commanded to love one another. That we are brothers and sisters, a part of a family. And John is highlighting this. And, and this re repeating theme keeps coming up and up over and over in 1 John. To, to love one another. Where do you belong? So, what do you believe? Where do you belong? And the third question he continues to ask is, how do you behave? How do you behave? And so one of the things he's going to say is obedience is a part of this triple test. Obedience to God's commands. As he just told us, though, those commands are not what? Those commands are not burdensome. So what religion tends to do is religion takes good things that we get to do and it makes them bad things that we have to do. 
So God is your Father, and He changes your nature through Christ. He gives you help, and He gives you the want to. He gives you the desires to begin to change and to transform toward Him. He equips you with that. And so here's what I would say to you this week. Here's the encouragement that I have received this week, and that is that when you are tempted, go to your deepest desire. What does John say that is? For some of us, we think that, that sin is that thing that we, we want to do, but because we are, are bound by these rules, we're not going to do it. So we think that sin is that desire for our lives. But what John is saying, no, 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 sin is not the desire for the life of the person who has been born of God. Sin is not that desire. That your deepest desire is to obey God's commands. And so how do we get to that desire? That we, we begin to focus on and, and realize that in, in us, God has given us the desires to, to do his will, to do what he commands us to do. And the Holy Spirit through John says that sin is not what you want to do. Rather, sin keeps you from doing what you want to do at the deepest level. So what does John say? In fact, this, this is love for God, to keep his commands. These commands that are not burdensome. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So in this day and age, as we've talked about in the past few, few weeks, groups have risen up to perpetuate this ideology and this ideology is that, that Jesus is just a good man. Uh, he's not the God man. And groups still re have risen up in our day and age uh, to perpetuate this ideology as well. And so John's going to bring forward a series of witnesses. Imagine yourself kind of in a courtroom of sorts. And he's going to bring up these, these three witnesses. Uh, this guy named Bertrand uh, Russell was an uh, atheistic uh, philosopher uh, in, the, in, in the 20th century. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950. And on one occasion, Russell was asked what he would say if, if he found himself standing before God. And so he played along, and Russell's answer said, I, I probably would ask, Sir, why did you not give me better evidence? He says, where there's evidence, no one speaks of faith. We do not speak of faith that two and two are four, or that the earth is round. We only speak of faith when we wish to substitute emotion for evidence, is what Russell says. And what we're going to find here is that, that the Apostle John, whom uh, Pete quoted during communion, you know, the, the Gospel of John, now we're in 1 John, and what, what John's going to say in 1 John is, is very much in disagreement with with Russell. He's going to say, no, there is evidences. There is witnesses to this reality of Jesus being who he said he was. And John says that there are three that testify. So let's read, starting in verse 6. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe that God has made him out to be a liar, because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. Verse 11, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Contextually, one thing that we need to understand is back in the Old Testament, in order for a claim or even an accusation to be substantiated, it required multiple witnesses. Like one would not do. It required more than one. So we read passages like in Deuteronomy 
chapter 19, verse 15, which says, One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so John is going to give us this witness testimony, and we can think about it almost like having two sides in a courtroom. And we can think about the one side that is perpetuating this idea that, that Jesus is just a good man, and then the other side is, is advocating this idea that Jesus is the God-man. And you have both of these going on, and John is addressing these by, by sharing about these testimonies, these witnesses. And, and one of the things that I want us to be reminded of as we get to this set of verses, as we get to this passage, is that everything in the Bible is equally true. But not everything in the Bible is equally clear. And so that is important for us. That's a, an important posture, I believe, for us to take as a church. Because what that requires us to do is it requires us to come to the Scriptures with humility. One of the things that has been detrimental to faith groups over the years is when, when they decide that they know exactly what this means and they have the, the corner market on every interpretation and if you don't follow that then then by George you are you're out of line you know and one of the things that I've learned over these past several years and still learning is that it requires much humility to come to the scriptures and so this verse is widely debated for there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. And so for some of us, we hear the spirit, and we might somewhat recognize, okay, the, the Holy Spirit, I kind of get that, but what is, what's going on here with the water and the blood? And there's several s scholarly folks who disagree on this. Some would say that the water and the blood refers to the sacraments. Some would say that the water is the baptism of Jesus and that the blood refers to the communion. And so it's a representation of those two sacraments. Some think that the water and blood uh, refer to the birth of Jesus. That when you're born, water and blood is present. And so this is to show that Jesus, again, in line with, with how John is presenting uh, his, his argument, that this is in line with to show that Jesus was born in the flesh, that he was actually a man, as well as a deity. Others think that, uh, his, that this means his birth and his death, that you have, uh, when you're born, you're wa the water breaks. Uh, when you die, there's the, you know, the, the shedding of Jesus' blood, so some believe that. When he's crucified, Scripture records, some of you will remember this, what flowed out of Jesus' side, water and blood. And so some people think that the water and blood is referring to, to that. Um, and here's what I want us to see, is that who we're talking about is not in question here. <laughs> who we're talking about is Jesus, amen? That's not in question. What is que in question here is, is how these things are pointing to him, how these things are referring to him. And so... I'll, I've gone back and forth this week on, on what I think it means. And I'll just be honest with you. And I will also share with you what I think it means could be wrong. <laughs> Fair? And so as you do your own homework and as you uh, study this, I would encourage you to, to reflect on you know, your own perception of, of what you think the Scriptures are saying. But I, I think John is referring to Jesus' baptism and his crucifixion. Uh, if you want to know who Jesus is, look, look at his baptism. You know, what, what do you remember that was said at Jesus' baptism? This voice from heaven, God the Father, says, this is my, it's my son. This is my son. And what does John go on to say? That, that God's testimony is greater because it's, it's the testimony of God. Like, you can't trump that testimony, Right? You, you, I mean, if you're calling some of the th things that you lawyers do, you know, you have this star witness, right? You know, and you, you bring in the star witness. Usually at the end of the case, here's the star witness. 
game, set, match, it's over, right? When you bring in God, <laughs> he's, he's kind of it, <laughs> all right? And, and so, you know, I think one of the things that John is, is trying to highlight here is, is, okay, this is God's testimony toward his son, that he is who he said he was. Verse 9, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God. Again, asking this question, is Jesus a good man or is, or is he the God man? That's the question that's being asked. And secondly, we look at the cross and we see how Jesus was treated and how he was responded. Jesus became obedient even to the point of death, even to the point of the shedding of his blood. Jesus' life was not taken from him. He gave it willingly. And so thirdly, we look at this, the Holy Spirit always tells the truth. The Holy Spirit never lies. Verse 7, there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We live in a culture that, that no longer acknowledges what's true and what's a lie. It's now, it's just all only your perspective. And what John reminds us is, no, the Spirit is truth. Jesus would even say that I am sending one who is going to guide you into all truth, the Holy Spirit the comforter, comforter, the advocate, the, the paraclete. And so, again, church, the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you and guide you into what Jesus said. He'll guide you into all truth. And you're welcome to dis disagree with that interpretation. You won't be the first to disagree, I assure you. But here's what I want us to consider as we close. And that is the fourth witness. John says in verse 11, and this is the testimony God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The fourth witness that we see here is, is John the Apostle himself, the oldest living disciple at this time, the only living disciple at this time in his 80s or in his 90s. He's walked with Jesus all these many years. That He's, he's, he's seen uh, the, the death and the, the burial and the resurrection. He was at the foot of the cross when, when Jesus died, and John is, is, is here, and, and he's saying, you know, look, the, the eternal life, eternity does, is not some pie-in-the-sky thing. Let's just grit our teeth and bear it until we all get to heaven, in the sweet by-and-by and the pie-in-the-sky. It's not what John is saying. John is saying that eternity begins when you meet Jesus. You can talk about a witness. We see that in John. What he says is that when you're born again, you've been changed internally. And that changes what you do externally. And that radically alters life eternally. And to that we say, amen. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for this word that you have shared with us today. We thank you for John. We thank you for his example. What a witness, what a witness to your goodness, what a witness to the deity of your son, and what a witness to the incarnation of your son, someone who actually walked with him and talked with him and shares these things in faith. Father, I just pray today that you'll come inside of us and remind us of who we are, and if we've not yet made that decision to give our life to Christ, to submit to him, to make him the Lord of our life, I pray that that decision will be made today. In Jesus' good name we pray. Amen. There'll be a shepherd down front. There'll be a shepherding couple back in this room. If you have a prayer need or today's the day that you want to give your life to Christ and be baptized into him, come and see me up front as we stand.